A very warm welcome to the last day of JLF Toronto Virtual Festival. On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjay Roy, and my colleagues at Team Bacarts and JLF Toronto, I welcome you to the first session of the day. Footloose, the travel session. Anthony Satin, Ruth Padel, Will Ferguson, and Manisha Rajesh in conversation with William Dalrymple. Travel writing is one of the most ancient forms of literature, but does it have any relevance in the age of internet, globalization, and Google Maps? British journalist and broadcaster Anthony Satin has written extensively on history, culture, and travel. His books include Young Lawrence, a portrait of the legend as a young man, and The Pharaoh's Shadow, Travels in Ancient uh, and Modern Egypt. Poet and novelist Ruth Badel's recent books are Beethoven's Variations, Poems on a Life, and We Are All from Somewhere Else, Poetry and Prose on Migration and Survival. She has also written Tigers in Red Weather, a journey across Asian forest in search of wild tigers, and is working on a follow-up book on elephants. Canadian travel writer Will Ferguson is well known for his books such as The Finder and Beyond Belfast, a 560-mile journey across Northern Ireland on sore feet. British travel writer and journalist Manisha Rajesh is the award-winning author of Around India in 80 Trains and her most recent book Around the World in 80 Trains. Together, they read from their work, discuss the genre and, Im and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on travel writing with historian and festival co-director, William Dalrymple. A little bit more on our speakers, Anthony Satin. Anthony is a journalist, broadcaster, and writers of, writer of stories of history and travel. His work has focused on the Middle East and North Africa, which he has explored through three highly acclaimed books of history and travel and two biographies, the most recent being Young Lawrence. He's now writing about how nomads have shaped our world. Our second speaker, Ruth Padel. Ruth's recent books are Beethoven Variations, Poems on a Life, and we are, on, we are All from Somewhere Else, Poetry and Prose on Migration and Survival. She's a professor of poetry at King's College London and is writing a book on elephants. Will Ferguson. Will is the author of four novels, including 419, which won the Scotia Bank Giller Prize a three-time winner of the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor, he has been nominated for both a Commonwealth Prize and an International Impact Dublin Literary Award. His most recent novel, The Finder, was an instant national bestseller. Monisha Rajesh. Monisha is a British journalist and an award-winning travel writer. She's the author of Around India in 80 Trains and Around the World in 80 Trains. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Sunday Times, Condness Nast Traveller and Vanity Fair in conversation with William Dalrymple. William is the best-selling author of City of Jinns, From the Holy Mountain, Age of Kali, White Mughals, The Last Mughal, Nine Lives, Return of a King, and Kohinoor. His new books are The Anarchy, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company, and Forgotten Masters, Indian Paintings for the East India Company. Dalrymple is one of the founders and co-directors of the Jaipur Literature Festival. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A. So please feel free to send in your questions by typing in the question box on your screens. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Do follow our pages at JLF Lit Fest across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to be notified of the upcoming sessions. Stay tuned to the jlflitfest.org slash Toronto for the full schedule and information about our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting Footloose, the travel session. William, over to you. Thanks, Saraj. Well, welcome to uh, 
what is always one of the most popular uh, items at any of our Jaipur festivals, wherever we take the festival, uh, whether in uh, North America or India or uh, uh, now Canada, um, we always have this session packed out. And uh, uh, most of the participants in the session have, have appeared at least once before on this, on the stage in Jaipur. So it's something of a greatest hits uh, round. And we're going to start by uh, everybody reading a short extract from their travel writing. And I think uh, uh, there's no one better to start it off than the great Anthony Satin, uh, one of the most admired travel writers in the country, uh, whose uh, Pharaoh's Shadow is a particular favourite of mine. Anthony, do you want to kick off uh, by reading? Thanks, thanks, William. And, uh, and and how nice to be in Toronto, at least virtually, if not physically. Um, I, I'm not going to read from the Pharaoh's Shadow. I thought I would do something different because I want to make a point about how travel writing comes into all writing. And so I'm going to read from the beginning of, um, of my Young Lawrence, this book here, um, which is about T.E. Lawrence or Lawrence of Arabia. And it's about my involvement with the man. Um, like the words of great poets, Lawrence's name is carried on the wind. It reached me at an early age, and one way or another it has hung about me ever since. As a child I saw David Lean's film Lawrence of Arabia with Peter O'Toole's intelligent if not highly accurate portrait of the man. He did at least capture the wayward nature, the staring into space, the smiles, the love of pranks and obscure comments, that mix of shyness and irrepressible liveliness in the man. The film is based on the extraordinary book that Lawrence wrote in the 1920s, which describes in vivid detail and passion his war experiences, which he called Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Half a century after its publication, engaged in the Middle East myself, I remember reading the book, and, and since then, on many occasions, in and near the desert, in Jordan and Egypt and elsewhere, I've been encouraged by Bedouin, camel her herders and others to be Lawrence, by which was meant I should mount a camel, tie a kefir on my head and ride into the sands, although I, like the young Lawrence, prefer to walk. But in spite of all this exposure, at no point was I swept away by the man or his, or his myth. I took the view that the importance of both the Arab revolt of 1916 to 18 and of Lawrence's role in it had been overplayed and that the revolt was little more than a sideshow in the First World War. And Lawrence, while he may have done considerably more than was expected of a junior liaison officer, had neither created nor led the uprising. But time changes many things. In the 1990s, I traveled through the Syrian mountains where I was told I would find the remains of extraordinary Crusader era castles. Looking for books to read before I started, I came across Lawrence's Crusader castles, the final incarnation of his undergraduate thesis. As I follow, followed the trail from Aleppo to Sayoun, from Markab to Masyaf, from Crack to Chevalier to Safita, I realized I was also following the man. Lawrence was 20 years old when he started on that journey in the summer of 1909, and I was older when I made mine. I'd had more difficulty getting into Syria, which was then ruled by Hafez al-Assad, because something I'd written about the country had upset someone in the Syrian government so that for several years my visa applications were turned down. When I was finally allowed to visit, the Syrian travel agent who organized my trip took me to meet the man from the ministry and smoothed my way. He also warned me to look out for myself while traveling in the remote hills. Similar words were said to Lawrence before he set out. All of those warnings melted away when I reached the old assassin stronghold at Kalat al kaf a remote rocky outcrop where the remains of the castle had mostly disappeared beneath greenery. The day was sunny and warm, my thoughts as clear as the air, as my memory is now of that moment when I began to wonder about this young Englishman who'd been there before me. I knew why I was there. I'd been living in Cairo for a couple of years and I wanted to see and understand more of the region and its people. But what would drive an exceptionally bright Oxford undergraduate to leave the comfort and safety of home to see the remains of Crusader castles in the Middle East in 1909. Why would he choose to walk at a time of great political and social unrest in the Turk-controlled provinces and in midsummer when the experts at home had advised against it? This moment is Im more important for me to hold in my memory than the first time I came across the Lawrence legend. At the first village beyond Kalatelkaf, a middle-aged man stopped me and as people like him have been doing for longer than we can know, 
he invited a traveller into his house. Over a glass of tea, with his children staring from the safety of the doorway, he gently led me through a series of questions that established who I was, where I had come from, where I was going, and why. I, in turn, asked about his land and what he grew on it, the size of the harvest and of his family, the state of the countryside, and eventually the pinch of the government. Curiosity satisfied on both sides, I continued on my way with his blessing, his younger sons herding me out as though I was some stray goat, until their father called them off and the breeze carried his blessings to me. Lawrence went through this ritual every day that he traveled in the region. And each time it happened, he, like I, was more charmed. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. Uh, Ruth, do you want to go next? Okay. All right. <clears throat> A bit of context. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, but in this book, I am in Western Sumatra on a volcano. And I'm reading this bit partly because, you know, the session is about what has Corona done to travel writing. And I'm doing my elephant research and I can't. I wanted to go to Myanmar and go on elephant patrols to see the elephant, you know, to ward off elephant poachers, all sorts of things. I can't do that. But maybe I shouldn't be. If I'm writing about conservation, should I be taking planes at all? Um, that's a, it's a sort of interesting question which we might discuss later. Anyway, this is about 15 years ago and I'm on a volcano called Mount Carinci in Western Sumatra, looking for tigers. And my guides are an extraordinary woman from Gloucestershire who's lived there and gone native for the last 30 years and is the toughest person who took me around anything, um, called Debbie. She runs a tiger patrol and Iwan, her radio operator. They were arguing in the stream about which way to go. Iwan says left is the quickest way up, but his way means this. This was a gigantic tree slide, bare earth down which thousands of trees had crashed. It stretched above us, a near vertical 15 foot wide ribbon of completely loose earth. If this were a ski run, said Debbie, it would be a black slope. I did not know what a black slope was, and I did not care. I am feeble about snow sports as well as water. I followed them, sticking to the edge where you could hold branches as well as the odd tree root, where the wild pigs, who did not like slipping either, had runkled up the earth. It was very slow work, squirming vertically on your stomach, thanking God for roots, hanging from your hands, letting your torso, legs, knees and toes worm up behind and find what hold they could. When dead branches broke, you lost painfully gained height. Sometimes all that held me was a dip in the soil where a knee could lodge. Two thirds up, I stuck. I could not reach the next handhold. Every time I tried, I slipped further down. I was a gecko on a glass mountain, stranded, my cheek against bare earth like a lover. I was gonna hang there forever. You all right, Debbie shouted. They were nearly at the top. Want you want to come down and give you a hand? Absolutely not. Because whenever they moved, stones and earth bounced down on my hair. At last a branch held, I inched up beside them and sat panting on a stone. We must have squirmed 500 feet. Iwan asked why you didn't want help. I said, because she doesn't want to be a mattress. All those stones. I'm glad metaphors are such fun, I said in Karinchi dialect. We pushed through scrub and found a knife edge trail. The other side, light green bushes overgrew another slide as steep as ours. We met an old man with a dog and sat with him on a grassy lump. He was cutting grass for his buffalo. Drought had withered all the grass lower down. He says there are five tigers up here, maybe three. I don't believe it. And he saw a large adult tigress here recently, that's all. It could be a mother and two grown cubs. She listened to the old man. He says they're large and small. A tiger sleeps on a rock overhang here and looks for food by the stream where we parked. The dog sat with his head against the old man's knee. What's your dog's name? I asked through Debbie. Blang, said the old man, stroking that Blang's head. Is Blang afraid of tigers? 
I ought to tell you that, that tigers do like eating dogs, and I heard a lot of dog eating stories. The old man thought, you must never be arrogant when you go in forest. You must be humble. Blang will be careful, so he will not meet a tiger. But you must never say, I am not afraid. Last week, I saw a tiger very close. I saw he wanted to eat my dog. I said, please, sir, do not interfere with my dog. After I said that, the tiger went away. He said, if you were lost in the forest and a dukun was with you, a dukun is a tiger shaman, a very important figure in rural Sumatra, and a dukun was with you, you could call up a tiger to find your way out. Otherwise, you search for the scrapes and the pug marks. A tiger's trail helps you get out. But tigers were not supposed to meet people. If they did, they had to travel seven hills for 40 days. Very unfair on the tigers, in my opinion, said Debbie. He said tigers, as well as people, should obey forest rules. But the traditional laws were all designed not to annoy them. That was why the man said, please, sir, to the tiger. The tiger was preserver of the law. All the different areas had different rules, but they ended. Otherwise, Harimau Mara, tiger will be angry. These laws, said Debbie, maintain adat, forest safety. We always stress adat when we try to resolve conflicts with problem tigers. The old man snapped a bamboo stalk, showing me how spear, spear sharp the spike was. Everything is dangerous here, the old man said. You must never be arrogant, always afraid. That was no problem. Every time I went into a tropical hill forest, my legs wobbled, my muscles ached, my feet slipped. We plunged into a tiger-shaped tunnel of bushes, the ridge trail, bamboo, high grass, and then at last, primary forest. Olive dark air, breathed bark and leaf, brown earth, dark roots, silver moss, splashes of light on leaf surfaces, and bamboo covered in long thorns. No touch, said Iwan. Hairy bamboo, said Debbie, seriously ghastly if it gets in your clothes, stings like fire. I had never seen such variety of thorns. Even the lianas had them. In Laos jungle, lianas were friends to hang on to. Not here. A thin type was studded with little prickles all the way up. A silver white kind had thorns with pink points like a pit viper's tail. No touch, said Ewan again. Even the plants were poisonous and I shut my mind to snakes. Another forest rule, said Debbie, laughing. If you fall, you land in these. If you grab a handhold in a hurry, it's these. Monkeys peered down, each with a dark cap of Venetian velvet, pigtailed macaques traveling through a forest in a group. The light was lavender and silver green, the air grainy, the canopy closed in, protecting or menacing, you could feel it as either. A canopy gets lower as the altitude goes up, but these trees were many times higher than any I was used to. Sometimes the light rays slanted in, an eerie firework strand from a stained glass window. There were delicate changes in the undergrowth, a thousand greens, blackberry shadows, spandrels, tasseled sea pods, trefoils, a wild inner movement of bark and leaf, untouched for millennia. Cutting this would be like blowing up Notre Dame. But to look and wonder, you had to stand still. Every step was dodgy. You needed handholds all the time, and those had to be checked too for pit vipers or thorns. A trail came in from the right. <clears throat> Debbie brushed aside dead leaves. There, she said, a tiger footprint. Very light, the soil was so dry, pointing our way. You should never not respect a tiger, whispered Debbie. As the old guy said, you should never not be afraid, but tigers are okay animals normally. It's the other things to be afraid of, at least in daylight. The landslide, the inadvertent pit viper. And if we hear a growl, if it's loud, the tiger's probably far away. The softer the growl, the nearer, the more dangerous. She motioned us off the trail and we sat down screened from it in bushes, silent. We listened. Iwan lit a cigarette. Debbie unusually did not. The forest was still with a full live stillness, like a packed concert hall before the conductor comes. A hushed sea of branches where gods lived and tigers walked. Heart of the world. 
If there was meaning to the universe, the non-man-made meaning, this was it. The macaques had been rustling overhead, calling and grumbling. Now they moved away and fell silent. From behind the trees where Debbie sat came a light cough. A twig snapped on the trail we had left. There was a presence. The jungle was differently still as if holding its breath. Something was listening to us breathe, watching us listen. It lasted about 10 minutes and then we felt it fade. Debbie looked at me and smiled slowly as if waking from a dream. What was that? I breathed. Some large mammal, she said quietly, getting up. You feel the forest go still. When there's a large mammal around, there's a feeling. Could have been a golden cat, but the pigtails were definitely not happy bunnies and they wouldn't have worried about that. People say when the tiger wants to tell you it's there, it snaps a twig. She picked one up and snapped the sound that came in the stillness. Could have been a tiger going along our path, stopping to check us out. Probably was. We came out on the trail. Can't go further up. Be dark before we got back. Not a good idea going back in the dark. I started down, but she stopped me and pointed. In soft earth, over the imprint of my Tunisian trainer was laid like a love token, a very large, deep, fresh pug mark. Ah, that's wonderful. Fantastic, Ruth. Thank you. I think this is your second string after your poetry, too. It's just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Manisha, do you want to go next? Uh, and uh, take a hello. How are you? Why not? I'm all right, thanks. Um, apologies if I'm wobbling around a bit. I made the daft decision to go to a standing desk. So uh, <laughs> one of my legs has got a bit dead already. Um, but I'll try not to move too what about much. your daughters? Are they likely to break in or are they... No, are they at the same no. No, no, they've been dispatched to the park with Dad, so we're safe till about four <laughs> o'clock. They're fine. They're, they're there um, Go for I, it. I've, um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. As um, everyone else said, it's quite nice to be in Toronto, albeit virtually. Um, over the last few months, I've, um, I think I've been quite, quite aware of the fact that not being able to travel has made me, I don't know what the words, I think I've become very aware of my privilege when it comes to being able to travel and not being able to has made me see how other people around the world have had to live and how much travel is a real luxury for us and I think it really has taken me to this point to come to that conclusion. So because of that, um, and I hope it's something we can discuss later, um, I'm going to read a little chunk from Around the World in 80 Trains, um, which I did a few years ago and this segment is from when I travelled in North Korea. Um, I spent 10 days there on a chartered train journey, which took uh, us out of Pyongyang and all around the country, down the coast and back up through some of the main cities, which had only just been opened up to tourists. And it was the first time in my seven month travels around the world that I became very aware of how we take travel for granted, because this is a group of people who cannot travel. They have never been able to travel. They know nothing of the world outside apart from what they're fed. And so that was one of the reasons I wanted to go was not just to see it for myself, but to all, I don't know, to some degree, let them see what people from the rest of the world are like and hopefully not be too repulsed by what they saw. Um, OK, so the bit I'm going to read starts. It was the it happened to be the 70th anniversary of the Workers' Party the week that we went. So there were a lot of rehearsals for dances going on at the time. Loudspeakers played a crackling piece of dated music. It was early evening and we had gathered at the edges of the main square in Wonsan to watch more than a thousand Korean students take part in a mass dance in preparation for the upcoming 70th anniversary celebrations. The women were dressed in colorful chimo jogori and the men were wearing white shirts and red ties. It looked much like a barn dance, linking arms and dancing do si do in circles they appeared to be enjoying themselves, and the guides clapped and cheered in support. Mr. Song grabbed us one by one and told us that we could join in. Uncomfortable at the thought of interrupting them, we hovered at the edge waiting for someone else to go first. It was like being back at school again. Jeff ventured forward and Mr. Song appeared from nowhere, grabbed my hand and thrust it into the palm of a tall man who had to let go of his partner and lead me as though it were the most normal thing in the world. Too embarrassed to make eye contact, 
I noticed that Jem was dancing with the girl who'd been thrust aside to make way for me, and she was struggling to keep him within the formation, but laughing and patiently guiding him. This was what I had longed for all week. As we held hands and twirled, we became an unbroken chain of young people having fun. Little stood between me and the tall North Korean with warm hands, but music and energy. A surge of heat flushed under my skin and I could feel tears at the corners of my eyes. They weren't out of sadness, sympathy or pity, but a sense of nostalgia for when we were small kids, unburdened by prejudice, when we played with everyone without caring who they were or where they were from. The music stopped and the crowd broke apart into applause and we bowed, thanking our partners and darted back to the side, exhilarated. As the others joined the next dance, I wandered over to Nick, who was enthralled by the scene. Leaning in, he said, Do you know, there's nothing here, apart from violent oppression, that isn't reminiscent of European society a hundred years ago, where everyone respected the heads of state, and for an event they would all come out onto the town square for a dance. If it's all been propaganda, that has been a triumph. I bought it. Really? I asked. Oh, absolutely. I'd recommend most people come and see it for themselves and make up their own minds. I've seen worse in Glasgow and the north of England than here. Even their poor neighbourhoods are clean and painted and they have very neat looking houses. The people don't have an obesity crisis. They look healthy. It's not all Soviet grey. There's a lot that's really good about it and I think that people ought to get out here and see it. For the first time since we'd arrived, we were allowed to walk back to our hotel unchaperoned, and it felt like we had just been given permission to strip naked and do somersaults. The buzz of crowds coming down from a high reminded me of walking home from Hyde Park after a summer festival, and yet there were no empty cans of Strongbow in the street, no pissed up idiots collapsed under the trees, no remnants of goat curry and wooden forks in the gutter. Everyone ambled along. Elderly women swept up leaves in the road by torchlight, and although... Sorry, I've got a big load of pictures here. And although it was dark, tiny children walked home alone. So safe was it for them to do so unaccompanied. There was much to Nick's observations that appeared true. The following morning, I was sitting on the coach and waiting for the others to emerge from the hotel. A couple of men were milling around, smoking and chatting to our driver, when a man on a bike sailed past them, slowing briefly to reach into his jacket and pull out a digital camera. In a flash, he passed it to one of the men who pocketed it without saying a word and carried on smoking like nothing had happened. It all took place with such speed that I wondered if I'd imagined it. Either I had just watched something underhand take place or my paranoia had finally got the better of me. I resolved to bring it up with Jeff when I saw him. As we boarded the train for the last time, I was overcome with sadness that the trip was coming to an end. The journey from Wonsan to Pyongyang would take just over eight hours, and we had only one more day in Pyongyang before taking the train back to Beijing. Yet I was relieved. It had been a long nine days, and the strain of being polite and vigilant was taking its toll. Even Bob was subdued and had on his lap a brown envelope of family photographs to keep him going. He had spent the last couple of days trying to ring his wife with no success. He passed the photographs to me and Jem and pointed out his grandchildren and Brenda, a smiling lady with blonde curly hair. Oh, I love them, said Bob. She's such a good woman. It was our 55th wedding anniversary a few days ago, but we're going to celebrate together when I'm home. I was touched by how much Bob yearned for his family and hoped that I'd be the same in 55 years, struggling to be without them for 10 days. In the autumnal light, Kangwon province throbbed with life and color. Curving through the bottom of a canyon, the train raced against a river throwing itself around the bends and banks of green. The canyon appeared aflame with maple trees, draping a shawl of gold and red over the valleys, and once again the sky burned that beautiful blue. Lee was sitting in his compartment going through notes about the next day's activities, so I stepped in to ask what we would see at the mausoleum. In addition to the embalmed bodies of the Kims, the mausoleum housed the private train carriages in which each leader had travelled, and in the case of King Jong-il, died. The official story was that he'd been out in the countryside inspecting a dam and had succumbed to a heart attack having worked himself to death. His body was found in the train carriage. However, 
The story was quickly challenged by the South Koreans, who declared that Kim's train had remained stationary in Pyongyang. Like most stories, it was impossible to corroborate. Lee described how important the railways were to North Korean pride and identity before despairing for another smoke. Jeff, who'd been listening quietly in the corridor, sat down with his bottle of soju, which was almost finished, and checked that everyone else was out of earshot before drawing the door closed. What Lee said isn't untrue, but the railways are basically the product of Japanese militarism during World War II. They weren't necessarily a communist or Stalinist creation. When Korea was a unified colony under Japanese rule, Japan built many of the current lines as part of its expansion across Asia. They even had their Korean military headquarters at the same place as the main US military base in South Korea now, in large part because of the major railway nearby. They could quickly sling their shoulders across the whole of Korea, as in what's now the North and the South. Long before the Korean division, a lot of battles between Russia, China and Japan were fought over the railway arteries. I have a question, I said. Why do they not wear Kim Jong-un on their badges? And why does Miss Kim refer to Kim Il-sung in the present tense? Given that the current leader is so dictatorial, I'm a bit surprised that he doesn't enforce the wearing of his own badge. Kim Il-sung rules from the grave, he said. North Korea is a necrocracy, if you will. I'd never heard the word before. And as for Kim Jong-un, let's just say he hasn't yet earned his colours. Fantastic, Manisha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very few people get to see what you've seen, uh, particularly the North Korean section. Uh, is, is, is an amazing, uh, rare achievement, a, a, a telegram from the abyss. Anyway, Will Ferguson, are you there? Hello. Yes, how are you? How are you in? Please, Sorry? go for it. We've, we, are, um, we, we are running out of time. I'm going to take, I'm going to re remove my own reading. Uh, but give you some time, Will. Go for it. Okay, thanks. Well, I'm I'm going to read from um, The Finder, which is fiction, uh, but it's based in the world of travel writing, which is a field I've been working uh, in for about 25 years. And it's the core of the story uh, is about lost objects scattered across the world, but the book itself, my reading is very short, uh, but the, the book itself, the novel is... Uh, the core of it is a group of travel writers who get caught in Christchurch during the earthquake. And it's kind of taking the piss out of travel writers and the pretensions <laughs> of the genre. And the main character is a, a guy named Thomas Rafferty. He was a burnt out middle-aged travel writer. Uh, I know I get these crazy ideas for characters. Um, and he has the world, the current world record for describing locations and destinations as lands of contrast. So he's now described 147 destinations as a land of contrast, which makes him a legend among travel writers. Uh, people ask me how much of Thomas Rafferty is, is based on me. And I tell them his last name is Rafferty and my last name is Ferguson. So it's clearly two very different people. Uh, this, the book goes from Southern Japan, uh, Hataruma Island in Southern Okinawa to the Australian outback to New Zealand. I was on assignment to write about Maori art and the Hakka. So the reason, the reason I'm reading this passage is, although there's a mystery in the novel and Rafferty is trying to track someone down, I folded in my travel journal into the fiction. And I think fiction and travel really uh, blend together. Uh, they're very similar approaches. I think of Paul Theroux. Um, I think of uh, Paul Theroux's Mosquito Coast, perhaps, or Pico Ayer's Cuba in the Night. So this is just me having fun folding my own travel notes into a, a scene uh, about a mystery. And it's set in northern New Zealand in Rotorua in Hell's Gate. He had driven through tunnels of green to get here, past lakes wet with mist, under overhangs of forest and filigreed patterns of ferns. The crumble and hiss of heat escaping, a shifting landscape, the smell of gunpowder and brimstone, a visitor center and a sign, welcome to Hell's Gate. Hell has a souvenir shop? Of course, hell has a souvenir shop. He was passing himself off as a travel writer, which although technically true, wasn't entirely honest either. Who are, who, who are you with then? The Maori guide had asked Rafferty when he showed up. Rafferty made a vague gesture in the general direction of Toledo. I'm with the free press, he said. A lie, but not a complete lie. He had indeed pitched 
the Toledo Free Press a possible travel feature on New Zealand's hot springs. It was the Schrodinger's cat of assignments. Until he opened his email that evening, he was both on and not on assignment. Europeans had been coming to Hell's Gate at Rotorua since the 1880s. Ladies with parasols and men with mutton chops and top hats. This was where tourism in New Zealand began, in these mist-shrouded, egg-scented airs, an unstable, otherworldly landscape. They came here to float in the blood-warm waters amid a Calvinistic landscape of grim hells and scowling heights, of broken peaks and sunless valleys. The spiced earth, the scorched smell of a forest in summer, tiger-striped with light, if you listen carefully, you could hear the trees exhaling. Rafferty and the Maori man came out of the forest and into purgatory. Calcified minerals remained where the water had boiled off. The entire landscape looked like the inside of his electric kettle. The Maori man pointed out the meaning of the colors as they passed. The yellow, that's sulfur. Gray is silica. Orange and brown are copper and iron. Pink is cinnabar. I should, I should mention this next part actually happened. He said, pink is cinnabar. The guide stopped and looked at Rafferty, dubious. Don't you need to write that down for your travel article? Oh, right, right, said Rafferty. He rummaged around his jacket, came up with a notepad and the nub of a pencil, scribbled down something that was meant to resemble shorthand. Right, the travel article. You mentioned this was Maori land, Rafferty said, circling back to what the guide had referred to earlier. I wanted to ask you about that. He rummaged around in a different pocket, brought out a folded sheet of paper, a paper with a name on it. I'm looking for someone, an American, an ethnologist. Her name is Rebecca. I think she's been gathering stories about the lost artifacts of this region, Maori artifacts. Do you know where she is? The other man knew, but he wouldn't say. He stopped, stared at Rafferty. Who are you, he asked. Who are you really? Thanks. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. So, Will, in that passage you you were taking taking the mickey out of travel writing someone who's 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 um ha had a number of concerns about travel writing different ones is manisha manisha do you want to um in a sense put your case of, of, of why you think travel writing uh, needs reformation at the moment this is something you've been very vocal about in yes. a number of fora lately <laughs> go for it <laughs> no i have i think um it is definitely something that i've seen changing which is great but I think it's it's not news to anybody that travel writing has largely been the preserve of posh white men um, and <laughs> and and also the grandsons of broke Belfast orphans. Just speaking for myself, <laughs> um, but I think it it has been a, a long tradition, and I think for the most part, especially in the UK. I mean, I know in India it's very different. So when we've discussed this at JLF before, um, it's not quite the same because there are a lot more women and you know, Indian people who are actually doing travel writing now. And I, and I know that way back, you know, when travel writing first started, you referred, you know, you always sort of cite Ibn Battuta. But in between that, I think there's very much been that element of colonialism that has forged travel writing's path. And it's only really been in the last probably two to three years that I've actually seen books on the shelves by people who aren't white men. And it's been... And I always find it quite interesting that when I'm reviewed or whenever people talk about my books on social media, I will get something like, she's no Paul Theroux or she's no Bill Bryson. And it always entertains me that I'm always compared, you know, with the men who've done the things before me when what I do is very different. I mean, I might write about trains, but coming from my background and also being a brown woman, I approach travel in a very different way from from white men. I mean, even just down to very simple things like not being able to go out at certain times of night or not traveling into certain areas where I just feel automatically unsafe um, in a way that say Paul Theroux just didn't and how he would just hop into a night train and just slide into a berth and not even think about the safety or the sort of things that just naturally come to women as an instinct, but then also to, to a brown woman who you know, I've, I've been through some really horrific experiences doing travel writing, especially in, in Russia. Uh, and but but also there's the upside to that as well. And, you know, I have a friend who does a column at The Telegraph now who's Indian, British Indian. And, and he was saying that often 
being Indian has made other cultures warm to him faster than if he'd been white. And he'd find that a lot of cultures in, you know, the Maoris and people would automatically just find a kinship with him because they said, you've got your culture and we know that and we trust you more as a travel writer. And that was also something that I found a lot when I traveled that it does often make quite a difference and open different doors to you. Um, but yes, that's that's sort of been the, the bugbear that I've had. And over the last sort of five or six months, especially since the Black Lives Matter movement, there has been a lot of discussion about the decolonization of travel writing. Um, but I'm glad, I'm really glad that it is something that's being discussed a lot and there have been a lot of webinars about it. And I think for me, the issue is more that it's in newspapers and magazines. And Anthony, you've probably, I mean, you probably know this and see this as well because you do a lot of press in the UK. Um, it's very, very rare to see brown and black people with bylines in travel sections. And so the same, the same kind of arguments and, and articles are being churned out all the time with very little new perspectives. I don't know what, um, you know, anyone else? Ruth, I'd love to turn to you next. You mentioned in your, in your um, introduction, another uh, issue with travel writing at the moment, um, uh, quite different from the, the problem of, of colonial hangover, which is the issue of, of of the ecology. I mean, do you think that travel writing is something that is likely to survive in a world where uh, where, where we're also carbon uh, conscious and uh, and people are very anxious now about uh, uh, travelling to the other side of the world for pleasure uh, or for writing? Well, I don't know where it's going, and I don't know when we come out of that. That's when we come out of if we come out of Corona, um, whether we're going to, the world is going to go back because. Everything has had such a respite at the moment, the skies, the, the, the animals, the wildlife. And so what's going to happen? I don't know. But I now do feel sort of uncomfortable at the thought that my, my you know, finishing my elephant research is going to mean several more, um, you know, carbon costly trips to Asia. And how do I square that with the fact that I am a conservationist, that, I, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, an emblem. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, and one of the things that Corona has done for everybody is make them investigate their own backyard much more closely. I mean, I know a woman in Islington who's always been traveling and now she's just walking around Islington. She's discovering all sorts of things about the history as well as the geography of, of, of just her locality. Um, so I haven't got an answer to that. I mean, I am going to go back as soon as I can. I do want to go to Myanmar. I want to go and investigate, you know, Thailand, all sorts of things. You and go by hot air balloon or something. Is there, is there <laughs> any other option? <laughs> Myanmar's quite tricky. <laughs> but I, I like the idea of going on the train for sore feet. Yeah. Um, Anthony, um, do you want to defend the genre as someone that's written a number of classic travel books? Um, from these two two worries, a that one that, that uh, so much of travel writing can be viewed as a colonial hangover, and b that it's it's so ecologically costly that uh, uh, does it outweigh the benefits? Well, um, well, first of all, let me say I'm speaking on, as as the grandson of of uh, immigrants <laughs> from Eastern Europe, so, <laughs> so I have no great, <laughs> great British pedigree here but but i think you know the thing about the thing about travel writing is it has always constantly evolved and, and reinvented itself and i think we're on a, at a really exciting moment because i i agree with 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 everything that's been said you know it it has been you know colonial and it has been predominantly white and it has been all sorts of things i think all that's going to change dramatically and for lots of reasons partly because we want it to and partly because the old model is completely broken anyway. I mean, we're in a, we're in a time of huge flux. Um, I was at a, there was a meeting of, of some travel people at the beginning of the year called by uh, Extinction Rebellion to talk about what we could do to try and, you know, and, and change things. And we, all, we writers said, well, we can't start telling people not to travel. We just spent half, you know, all our lives traveling, right? getting paid to travel around the world to write about these places. We can't suddenly say, you can't go. Um, and they say, well, yes, you can. And we said, well, even if we did, it's not going to stop everyone. And they said, you just need to convince everybody that we need to look at things in a different way. And, and I said, that's never going to happen. And lo and behold, three months later, the whole world stops. And, you know, and, and so things can change and they have changed. And I think what we're going to take out of this period is that memory of, you know, that nothing is, in, is impossible. So yeah, I'm sure we will slide back some way, but things will not be the same, even if they feel the same. And that sense of, 
you know, we have a responsibility to, you know, to our children, our grandchildren, our, the, to the, the, the planet itself. And we, that is going to come out in all sorts of ways in the writing, I think. Uh, Will, can I turn to you next? We, we've got a question from Sudhir Majumdar who says, given all this, uh, are we ever going to see another in Patagonia or a, a great railway bazaar? Or, or he kind of mentions my book in Xanadu. Do you think, do you see books like that emerging in the future? Or do you think that, uh, that they are like relics of the dinosaurs from a previous age? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, prophecy is a dangerous business. I, I can say that regardless of your background, whatever background you draw on, Travel writing is self-aggrandizing. This is a very egocentric business. It's about me, me in a place, regardless of your background. That's what it's about. So I think the question is, do we have these giant self-aggrandizing uh, personalities? Of course we do. Uh, can they get away with it anymore? I'm not so sure. Um, as, and just to flip it over about, about travel writing, I just wanted to make a point. It's always been... Uh, a, delusional it's always been on the edge of of fakery uh, any travel writing is a is a trip remembered and presented in a certain way and i think of my son when he uh, was young the twilight books came out and he got all excited he was in junior high and uh it was the vampire romances and he got really really excited and i bought him the series and he gave up after the first one and i said why he goes well dad i thought it was vampire romances but it was actually vampire romances. And I think a lot of people, whenever they do a survey of dream jobs, travel writing is always at the top because people think it's travel writing, but it's really travel writing. And the writing is almost universally first person. So I think it's more, I don't think it's uh, uh, the nature of travel. And I think it's the nature of the, of the type of personalities that we, uh, we indulge. Thank you very much. I fear we've run out of time. I, I feel that this is a session we could have gone on for another hour, and I, I would have loved to have done a reading too. But anyway, we have to come to Jaipur Literature Festival proper, uh, which we're hoping to hold, I think, in February now. Uh, Sanjoy, are you there to confirm that? Or who's Suraj? Or oh, our yes, chair? yes, February it is. Um, and are we planning to do um, any live sessions, do you think, or will it probably be online? It'll be a hybrid, most probably, but let's see. We are still figuring out what's what will happen. Uh, but yeah, very good. Well, whatever happens, it'll definitely be a travel session. I can, as a co-director, I can tell you that. So, uh, anyway, thank you all for, for watching. Over to you, Suraj. Thank, thank you, thank you, Willie. Uh, thank you, Anthony, Ruth, Will, and Monisha for that really fascinating conversation and what really lovely readings those from uh, those were from each one of you. Our day is already made. Thank you so much. And thank you, William, once again, for moderating it so brilliantly. Thank you. And thank yes, you for yes. watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers, which are available through bookstores listed on the JLF Toronto website. Once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and we'll tune in for our next session, Mahabharata, Adapting Ancient Myth for Modern Theatre. Devdal Patnayak in conversation with Ravi Jain and Miriam Fernandez which is at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 9.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading by Hassan Namir from the Jaipur Writer's Short Series. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hassan Namir. Thank you so much to Jaipur Lurdy Festival for inviting me to read from my poetry book, War Torn, uh, published by Book Hug Press. So I'll be reading uh, the first few poems from the book. War Torn. The first poem, The Story of a Man. This is 1990. This is a Gulf War. This is a story of a man who dresses like a man, who talks like a man, who eats like a man. This is 2011. This is another war. This is a story of a man who dresses like a man, who talks like a man, who eats like a man. This is 1990. This is when I held on to you. And the story of a man who walks like a man, who pees like a man. This is 2011. This is when I hoped you would in the story of a man who farts like a man, who drives like a man, who shits like a man. 
This is 1990. This is when I struggled for you. In the story of a man who pays like a man, who drinks like a man, who comes like a man. This is 2011. This is when you fought with them. In the story of a man who drives like a man, who cries like a man. The next poem I'll be reading called The Worst. My legs were hanging in the air. Words were like the shape of a rope against the throat. I hadn't understood what it meant to be different, to stand out as the worst of humanity, worse than the gutter, worse than the worst sin, like a dagger in its scabbard, pushing at the skin. I saw half my soul waiting on the other side. I had committed the worst sin, worse than marrying a Christian. I was a shav, a fucking queer, and a lutely, a damn faggot. I want to have a family. How hard can that be? A man, and a man, and a baby. And the final poem that I'll be reading called Pairs. Two pairs of legs over the bed, lutely and shav, faggot and queer, fuck each other, sodomites and saffron, too many gazes, Mesjid yawning in almond, two cock-sucking angels, the Caspian Sea glistens by a broken window. A mother watches. Two boys come on each other. A breeze sifts their eyes open. A God can't watch. Allah can't watch. Thank you so much. Bringing India to the world and the world to India through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers, and literary agents. 
Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavor of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, shared history in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts, celebrating the arts. For more information, visit www.teamworkarts.com